Thank you so much. It really is a pleasure to join all of you tonight on this balmy summer evening in Palo Alto at the Hoover Pavilion. I think today's topic is very important. It's age-related macular degeneration, an eye condition that probably affects someone you know. It's a rapidly eye condition because our population is living longer and it's a disease of aging. What are the key take-home points of my discussion today? First, I want to share with you some of the known risk factors for developing age-related macular degeneration, such as age, genetics, and race. Second, we're going to go over a simple classification of age-related macular degeneration so you understand what your potential diagnosis is if you go to an eye doctor and they tell you you have a certain stage of AMD. Third, we're going to talk about how untreated wet macular degeneration results in loss of your central vision. And that's why it's important to get diagnosed early and get effective treatments when recommended. Finally, we'll go over how to obtain diagnosis and treatment in order to preserve your vision and your quality of life. The eye and the sense of vision is so important to all of us. When we encounter the outside world to see the beautiful flowers, to see our friends, or to read books, we depend on our vision. And many studies have shown that people value their vision as one of the most important factors of their health. Let's briefly review the eye anatomy. The eye is a small but very complex and important structure. In fact, the retina, which is the thin layer of tissue that lines the back wall of the eye, is a part of the brain. The front part of our eye is the clear part called the cornea. And then the colored part of our eye, the iris, gives you either blue colored eyes, brown or hazel colored eyes. Behind the iris sits the lens of the eye. With aging, you can develop cloudiness of the lens, which is called a cataract. And maybe some of you know people or even yourself who've obtained cataract surgery in order to remove that cloudy lens. Behind the lens is the posterior segment of the eye. And there lies the retina, that thin film of tissue that coats the back wall of the eye. This is the area that can be affected by macular degeneration. Age-related macular degeneration is the leading cause of blindness in people over 50 years of age in developed countries. That means in the United States, age-related macular degeneration is the leading cause of blindness in people age 50 years and older. 80% of affected people have the dry form of macular degeneration. 20% of the people affected have the wet form. One might ask, what's the difference between dry and wet macular degeneration? We'll review that in just a few minutes. First, let's briefly discuss the risk factors for developing age-related macular degeneration. Numerous scientific studies have shown that genetics can play a key role in the development of AMD. In addition, if you're of Caucasian ethnicity, you have a higher risk for potentially developing age-related macular degeneration than someone of a different ethnicity. And finally, increasing age is also an important risk factor because we see this condition in people who are usually 50 years of age or older. Let's look at the genetics. What have we learned over the past five years? When scientists like myself conducted research on large groups of people, we found that as a certain genetic marker increases your risk for developing age-related macular degeneration. 
In fact, that marker is called complement factor H. And there's a specific polymorphism, that is a change in that gene that puts you at a higher risk for developing macular degeneration. Complement factor H is located on chromosome 1. And an alteration in this leads to an upregulation of inflammation, which we think leads and plays a role in the development of age-related macular degeneration. Patients who are homozygous, that is, have two affected copies for this risk allele, can have a sevenfold increased risk of developing age-related macular degeneration. That's significant. What are some modifiable risk factors for the development of age-related macular degeneration? As I said, first, our genes, we can't change that. That's what we were born with. Our age, we can't change that too. Our ethnicity, that's something that we were also born with. But there are some modifiable risk factors, lifestyles that we can alter that can decrease our risk. One of the modifiable risk factors is smoking. We've learned through numerous medical conditions that smoking is very dangerous. It not only increases the risk of lung cancer, but it also increases the risk of developing age-related macular degeneration. So the number one thing we tell patients if we know that they're still active smokers is we need to have smoking cessation, to learn to stop smoking. In addition, some studies have also indicated that an increase in the waist to hip ratio can also increase the risk of macular degeneration, which means obesity is also a modifiable risk factor. If we're overweight, it's better to try to lose that extra weight, not have an elevated body mass index, because being overweight can cause numerous problems and can also increase the risk of age-related macular degeneration. When you're concerned about your eye, who do you go to? Exactly. An ophthalmologist is an eye medical doctor. The ophthalmologist went to medical school, is specifically board certified and trained to evaluate and treat eye diseases and an ophthalmologist is trained to do eye surgery when necessary. When one has a problem in the retina, the tissue in the back part of the eye, and has age-related macular degeneration, there's a specific type of ophthalmologist, a retina specialist, who has performed additional fellowship training to specialize in the management and treatment of retinal diseases, of which age-related macular degeneration is one of them. I am a board-certified ophthalmologist who has done additional subspecialty training in diseases of the retina. And a retina specialist is the ideal type of eye doctor you should see if you're concerned about age-related macular degeneration. How do we detect AMD? First, when you go to your ophthalmologist or retina specialist, we do a careful and thorough eye exam. This involves first checking your vision, checking your eye pressure, and then administering topical drops onto your eye in order to dilate the pupil. This allows the doctor to view the retina which is hidden in the back part of the eye. When I try to examine the retina, I do several different procedures, one of which is putting the patient in a slit lamp microscope, and we use various handheld lenses to give us a more magnified view of the retina in order to see if there is age-related macular degeneration present. What is age-related macular degeneration? In order to understand this pathogenic state, we first have to look at the normal retina. The retina 
is in the back part of the eye. And it's a complex tissue. It has different cellular layers to it. And underneath the retina is a basement membrane and a tissue called the RPE, the retinal pigment epithelium. All of these layers have to be healthy in order for you to have ideal, perfect vision. In the initial stages of age-related macular degeneration, one develops drusen, which are these yellow aging deposits beneath the retina. They appear as these little yellow dots on examination that are deep to the retina. When we look at the histopathology of an eye with age-related macular degeneration, we see that the normal basement membrane becomes thickened and these drusen become apparent. When I'm examining a patient, I'm looking for these signs of drusen because if they're present, then this person likely has age-related macular degeneration. Now let's review the classification of AMD. When someone is seen and only has a few or no small drusen, we classify them as having no signs of age-related macular degeneration. When someone has many small-sized drusen, and we define small as less than 63 microns. 63 microns is very tiny. We could only see that under high magnification in a trained ophthalmologist's eyes. But if you have many small or a few medium size, medium or between 63 and 125 microns, then you have signs of early age-related macular degeneration. If one has many medium-sized drusen or one large drusen, then we put you in the category of having intermediate age-related macular degeneration. And if we see other signs, such as atrophy of the retina or the retinal pigment epithelium, then you have advanced age-related macular degeneration or if we see bleeding and swelling in the back of the eye, then you might have wet macular degeneration, which also puts you in the category of having advanced age-related macular degeneration. Advanced AMD, when untreated, will lead to irreversible loss of your central vision. We want to prevent that. Why do we classify macular degeneration? Because these different stages have different prognosis. If one has early age-related macular degeneration, you have a very low risk of losing your central vision in the next five to 10 years. If you are diagnosed with intermediate age-related macular degeneration, your risk of developing severe vision loss or advanced macular degeneration could be 12% in the next five years. What do we do to decrease your risk? One thing we've learned over the past 10 years is micronutrient supplementation with certain antioxidant vitamins can be beneficial. The National Eye Institute conducted a large randomized clinical trial involving thousands of patients with different stages of macular degeneration. And they found that taking a combination of these antioxidants provided some benefit. This medication, which is available over the counter, contains vitamin C, E, zinc, copper, beta carotene, or lutein and zeaxanthine. Why does it contain these antioxidants? Scientists hypothesize, thought that because macular degeneration is a disease of aging, there must be oxidative damage that occurs in the body and in the eye that contributes to the formation of AMD. So over a decade ago, they tested different antioxidant vitamins in 
people with macular degeneration. And lo and behold, they found that if you had intermediate macular degeneration, by taking these vitamins, you could decrease your risk of progression. If we look at this figure, it tells us a little bit about the results. People who are taking placebo, that is the pill without any antioxidants in it, they had a 28% risk over a five-year period of developing advanced macular degeneration. But when you took these supplements, your risk decreased to 20% over the next five years, represented by the light blue line. So there was a small risk reduction in patients who had intermediate macular degeneration if they took these supplements every day. That's become a standard of care now. If I encounter a patient and I diagnose them with intermediate macular degeneration, I will gladly recommend that they take these supplements for the rest of their life because it will help decrease the risk a tiny bit and every little bit helps. How often should you be examined for macular degeneration? If you have very early signs, then probably once a year is sufficient. If you have intermediate macular degeneration, then at least every six months with a retina specialist, or more often if you have new symptoms. Now let's discuss advanced macular degeneration. Remember, I mentioned that advanced AMD leads to severe vision loss if untreated. The most common cause of severe vision loss is the untreated wet form of macular degeneration. What are the symptoms? One might feel that they have reduction in their central vision or a dark spot, a scotoma in their central field of view. Sometimes patients complain of distortion. That is, someone's, their friend's face looks irregular or warped. Or it's, there's decreased contrast sensitivity. That is, you can't read things or discern different colors if there's not appropriate light. Or some people even have a reduction in their color vision. These could all be signs of the development of wet, age-related macular degeneration. What is wet macular degeneration? It's the development of abnormal blood vessels called choroidal neovascularization underneath the retina in an area it should never develop in. When these abnormal blood vessels sprout up, they distort the retina, they damage the retina, they can bleed, and that's why someone gets a reduction in their central vision. When I examine a patient and I see clinical signs of hemorrhage underneath the retina or swelling within the, the retina with the presence of fluid or elevation of the retinal pigment epithelium, which is the layer of tissue underneath the retina, that is very suspicious for the development of wet macular degeneration. How do I confirm the diagnosis? After a careful clinical examination, I'll obtain additional in-office imaging studies. I often obtain retina photos, so color photographs of the back of the eye so I can follow the eye over time and see subtle changes. In addition, there's a non-invasive imaging test called optical coherence tomography, OCT, which is a wonderful, very fast, non-invasive imaging test, which gives us a two-dimensional cross-sectional view of the retina. In this picture, the retina is elevated, represented by the green line. The red line underneath is the retinal pigment epithelium. And instead of being flat and horizontal, it's elevated because there's choroidal neovascularization growing underneath. Another important test that we do in our clinic is called fluorescein angiography. An intravenous vegetable dye 
is injected in your arm vein and our photographers take pictures as the dye goes through the retinal blood circulation to outline the blood vessels in the back of the eye. In this fluorescein angiogram picture, this eye has wet macular degeneration. The bright area represents abnormal blood vessels that are leaking. These blood vessels shouldn't be there. And because they're right in the center of the retina, they're causing a reduction in someone's central field of view. It's important to obtain a fluorescein angiogram because it tells us where the abnormal blood vessels are. We can quantify the size of them and follow them over time to understand how they respond to our treatment. Another new imaging tool that is available to us at Stanford is called OCT angiography. This new imaging technique provides complementary information. And it's unique because it allows us to visualize blood vessels without having to put in intravenous dye. It's a non-invasive imaging technique based on OCT but it takes it a step further. It allows us to visualize normal and abnormal blood vessels. We can see here highlighted by the yellow arrow, this is an area of abnormal choroidal neovascularization, abnormal wet AMD growing underneath the retina. This is another photograph showing a color photograph of the retina on the top, and then the OCT angiogram, outlining the retinal blood vessels that are present and some of the abnormal blood vessels on the screen left. Is there a treatment for wet macular degeneration? Fortunately, there is. Over the past decade, we've developed effective treatments to halt the swelling and bleeding that's associated with wet macular degeneration. How did we develop this? We discovered that when an eye has wet macular degeneration, there's elevated levels of a certain protein in the eye. This protein is called vascular endothelial growth factor, or VEGF for abbreviation. This is elevated in this abnormal condition. So scientists like myself thought, why don't we develop some type of therapy that blocks this abnormal protein? All of us need some level of VEGF, but when we have too much, it causes damage. So we want to cut down that elevated level. We need to block excess levels of VEGF in order to treat this condition. Therefore, clinician scientists developed a treatment, a medication that's administered in the clinic as an injection under topical anesthetic, and it delivers a medicine, a protein, that blocks high levels of VEGF. It might sound scary to you. I don't want an injection of a medicine into my eye, but this is done in the office under topical anesthesia and actually can be a very comfortable procedure. It's effective because it delivers the medicine right into the area where it's needed without having the medicine go throughout your entire body. This is a photograph of an eye that's receiving an injection of a VEGF blocker in clinic. These medicines have been used since the year 2005 and they've been proven in multiple randomized clinical trials to be an effective and safe treatment for wet macular degeneration. These injections are given every one to two months, depending on whether or not the wet macular degeneration is still active in your eye. Why do they have to be given so often? Because the medicine only lasts one to two months in the eye. Once the medicine wears off, 
sometimes those abnormal blood vessels want to grow again and wreak havoc again. That's why patients need to come back to their retina specialist every one to two months for re-evaluation. And if the disease is still active, we would recommend another treatment. You might ask, how many injections on average does someone need when they're first diagnosed with wet macular degeneration? If we look at one of our landmark clinical trials, it lists among these hundreds of study participants the mean or the average number of treatments through 24 months, two years of being in this clinical trial. And we can see when patients were treated on an as-needed basis, they needed about seven injections the first year. And then over a two-year period, they needed about 12 to 14 if, when they were treated every time the disease was active. So it's not a tremendous amount of injections. The majority of injections are necessary in the first year when the disease is most active. But it's important whenever we detect swelling or bleeding to administer a treatment because without it, those abnormal blood vessels continue to grow. And when they grow to a large, large size, they're harder to treat. Let's look at one of the visual acuity results from these landmark studies. This graph illustrates the mean change in visual acuity from baseline, which is 0 0.0, all the way to two years. And we can see that on average, patients gained about five to eight letters on the visual acuity chart if they followed up routinely and received the necessary treatment over a two-year period. These treatments can improve your vision if you follow up diligently and receive adequate care. If patients are undertreated or they're lost to follow up, then they don't obtain these visual acuity benefits. Let's look at a case. This is a 68-year-old man with a history of dry macular degeneration who came to me complaining of new decreased vision in his left eye. Previously, the vision was close to 20-20, which is perfect vision, but now it dropped to 20-60. On examination, I saw drusen and I saw elevation and swelling within the retina. So I initially obtained two tests. The top of the screen shows the fluorescein angiogram, that intravenous dye test accompanied by the photography of the retina, and it shows in that center that ring of abnormal blood vessels, confirming the diagnosis of wet macular degeneration. On the bottom, I performed OCT, which gives us that cross-sectional, two-dimensional view of the retina, and it shows that the retina is elevated that huge elevation, which normally shouldn't be present. This confirms this patient has new onset wet macular degeneration. That's the diagnosis. What do you recommend? The number one treatment is the administration of the eye injection of the medicine that blocks VEGF. And that's what I recommended in this particular case. After the first treatment, there still is elevation. And we know that most patients need on average about eight treatments over the first year. So I resumed additional treatments. And after multiple, multiple treatments, we can see that there is flattening of that elevation and a reduction of the swelling. The therapy is working. There is still active wet macular degeneration, so we still need to continue treatment, but we can see without this medication, we wouldn't have seen that reduction in the swelling. What happens if you don't treat wet macular degeneration? Well, unfortunately, those abnormal blood vessels continue to grow, and over time, scar tissue grows. That's a bad side. 
If you have scar tissue in the retina, unfortunately, there is no effective treatment to remove scar tissue. And that area with the scar will not improve, and your vision will have a permanent reduction in that area. That's why it's important to diagnose wet macular degeneration as soon as possible and to receive therapy to prevent scar tissue formation. I mentioned earlier there's two forms of advanced macular degeneration. The first is wet macular degeneration. The second is an advanced dry form of macular degeneration called geographic atrophy. Geographic atrophy is the name we use when there's dry macular degeneration that's accompanied by thinning of the retina, atrophy of the retina, and loss of pigmentation. That can cause irreversible vision loss. The retina has to be of normal thickness for one to have perfect vision. If the retina is too thick, swollen, your vision decreases. If it's too thin, if there's atrophy, your vision is decreased too. Just like the muscle in your body, if you have muscle atrophy, that muscle is weak. So that's why there's two forms of advanced macular degeneration, the geographic atrophy or the wet macular degeneration. Geographic atrophy, sometimes it's difficult and challenging to diagnose because we're looking for subtle signs of atrophy in the retina and loss of pigmentation. We have special photography machines called fundus autofluorescence, which allow us to take this special black and white photograph. If there's a loss of pigment, it appears as a large black spot. This person has an advanced form of geographic atrophy because there's this large piece of tissue missing. Loss of the pigment, loss of the retina in that area causing atrophy, which is picked up in this special imaging device. Unfortunately, at this time, there is no effective treatment for geographic atrophy. Right now, we are conducting clinical trials at Stanford and throughout the world looking at novel treatments to test for treatment of geographic atrophy. It's also important if you have geographic atrophy to still follow up with your retina specialist because eyes with this advanced form of macular degeneration could still develop wet macular degeneration too. Even though we can't treat the atrophy, if one develops wet macular degeneration, we still wanna treat that to minimize vision loss from that form of advanced macular degeneration. What are some new treatments on the horizon for wet macular degeneration? Although those injections to block VEGF are very effective, we want even better therapies because we know some people don't necessarily gain 10 letters of vision when they're treated with these eye shots. So we're looking at new medicines with longer duration of action that might allow patients to come in every three months to the eye doctor rather than every month. We're also evaluating stem cell therapy to see if that would provide benefit in macular degeneration. And we're also looking at gene therapy to see if that would be beneficial. All of these new exciting clinical trials are being conducted at multiple clinical centers throughout the United States and also at the Byers Eye Institute at Stanford University. In summary tonight, I think we've discussed some many important aspects of age-related macular degeneration. We reviewed the risk factors such as age, genetics, race, smoking, obesity. We learned the classification of early, intermediate, and advanced age-related macular degeneration. We also discussed that untreated wet 
macular degeneration causes severe vision loss. And that's why it's important to receive early diagnosis because we have effective treatments and we need to follow up closely with our retina specialists and ophthalmologists to obtain early diagnosis and treatment if we want to prevent vision loss. I'm very fortunate to work with outstanding colleagues at the Byers Eye Institute, which is located at 2452 Watson Cork, off of 101 and Embarcadero Road. We have a full service, comprehensive eye clinic that can properly diagnose all eye conditions. We specialize in macular degeneration and have all of these state of the art treatments and diagnostic tools available. I encourage you, all of you to have your eye examination with your local ophthalmologist or with one of our ophthalmologists at the Byers Eye Institute because early detection and treatment is so vital to keeping and preserving your eyesight. Thank you very much for allowing me to share this information with you tonight to answer any questions you might have. Great, we have a question in the back. At what stage do you start recommending the injections? The question is, at what stage do we recommend those eye injections? Those eye injections are only effective to treat wet macular degeneration. So one must have a diagnosis of wet age-related macular degeneration in order to receive benefit from these injections. If you have dry or intermediate macular degeneration, those injections are not effective. Uh, yes, this lady Does first. Does blood pressure come into effect with macular degeneration with the wet period? The question is, does blood pressure play a role in the development of macular degeneration, especially the wet form. Right now, blood pressure is not a proven um, risk factor for developing macular degeneration. High blood pressure, however, can damage the blood vessels in the retina and also lead to vision loss through a different mechanism. So it's important if you have hypertension to keep it under control because high blood pressure can damage your eyes in ways different than macular degeneration can. Thank you. Yes. Um, yes, question here first. Can you have macular degeneration that isn't age-related? The question is, can you have macular degeneration that is not age-related? Yes, you can. Macular degeneration can be a general term. And in tonight's talk, we are specifically dealing with age-related macular degeneration. But I do encounter in my clinic people who are younger, who are 30 or 40, who have changes in their macula due to another condition, but it causes degenerative changes as well. That's not related to this type of genetic predisposition or age. And some of those have effective therapies, but they need to be diagnosed. Other question? The gentleman on that side? If you have it in one eye, are you probably going to get it in the other eye too? The question is, if you have age-related macular degeneration in one eye, will you develop it in the yellow eye? Most likely, yes. Age-related macular degeneration is usually a symmetric condition. So when I encounter a patient, usually they have signs of drusen, those yellow aging deposits, in both eyes. One eye may be a little bit more severe, more advanced than the other. If one develops wet macular degeneration in one eye, the risk in the fellow eye also increases. That's why it's important to see your retina specialist often. A uh, question, the gentleman here with the tie. Have you seen anyone radically change their diet and cause reversal? The question is, can you cause reversal of macular degeneration by radically changing your diet? That's a great suggestion, but unfortunately, dietary changes only help a little bit. 
they will not reverse what's already happened. So it's not sufficient enough just to change your diet. You know, a lot of these risk factors, as I mentioned, genetics, ethnicity, age, even if you change your diet, you can't modify those risk factors. And those are stronger risk factors for the development of macular degeneration. Yes, this lady here. The question is, if you have the early stage of macular degeneration and you're already seeing an ophthalmologist, is it necessary to see a retina specialist? I think if you only have early signs of macular degeneration and you've been seen by an ophthalmologist, that that is probably sufficient. If you have intermediate or wet macular degeneration, then I would say it would be very important to see a retina specialist to confirm the diagnosis, and then if you have wet macular degeneration to obtain treatment. Um, yes. Yeah. The question is, if you're taking certain um, vitamins, will it interfere with these micronutrients tested in the age-related eye disease. Taking multivitamin, and we found that taking that combination was safe and didn't provide any additional harm. So. so you have the intermediate or advanced form. Gentlemen, over there. You mentioned both the possible weight-related as well as um, vitamin-related benefits. Uh, to what degree could exercise benefit or prevent uh, the onset of age-related macular degeneration, and how would the mechanism work for you? Yes. The question is, will exercise and keeping healthy uh, reduce the risk of developing macular degeneration. Right now, there's no current evidence to suggest that exercise alone would reduce the risk of macular degeneration. Certainly, exercise, I think, is very beneficial to the body and would help decrease that modifiable risk factor of the increased um, waist to hip ratio, the body mass index. So I think exercise is good for your general health and probably helps keep you know, your, um, your blood pressure, your cholesterol, all these signs that if abnormal can lead to more inflammatory damage in your body, certainly that could contribute to some of the oxidative damage that could occur in macular degeneration. So keeping a good weight, being healthy makes sense. Good. Um, yes, sir? Yes. I have like a two-part question. Sure. But uh, the first part is, um, with, uh, what's the progress with respect to uh, the stem cell research, and how how far have they gone, and yeah. to what extent? So that's my first question. Great. The question is, how far has stem cell research progressed? Right now, stem cell research is still in its early stages. So it's not widespread yet. There are complications with conducting stem cell research. First, the source of the stem cells, and are they safe to use in human eyes? So it's still in its infancy, but we are hopeful that there might be breakthroughs with stem cells, especially to regenerate tissue that's atrophied. So we're hopeful. Okay, this is the second question. Uh, with respect to what the individual can do, yes. is it possible to introduce things like eye exercise or even where you rotate the eye or you exercise your own eye and um, possibly lubricants using heat, cold, lubrication, lotion, whatever that would take? Yes. 
the question is, are there eye exercises or creams or lotions that you could do to your eye that would help decrease the risk of macular degeneration? Unfortunately, there are no eye exercises or topical ointments that are effective. In the past, we've reserved some eye exercises to adults who have a misalignment of their eye muscles, where they need to kind of refocus their line of sight to prevent their eye muscles from being misaligned. Eye exercises have not been proven to help in macular degeneration. In addition, topical ointments also have not been proven to be a benefit in macular degeneration. A question from the gentleman to the right. What is the probability rate of dry macular degeneration advancing to red macular yes. degeneration? Yes. The question is, what is the risk or the rate of dry macular degeneration progressing to wet macular degeneration. It's hard to give a general rate because it depends on the clinical features we see on examination. For example, I mentioned drusen, those yellow aging deposits. If one has large drusen, so the larger the drusen, the slightly increased risk of progression of the macular degeneration. In addition, if the back of the eye has a lot of pigmentary changes, hyper and hypopigmentation, that also increases the risk. And as we mentioned, if you have wet macular degeneration in one eye, the fellow eye, even though it has dry macular degeneration, the risk increases of developing wet. So it's an individualized number that can only be given when you're sitting in front of me in the clinic and I'm evaluating both eyes and determining those individual risk factors you have. Yes, sir. In my treatment of my case, which is yes. wet uh, AMD, yes. the vitriol injections cause tremendous pressure in the eyeball. Is, can that be avoided by another uh, treatment uh, other than the injections, or can it be don't? Uh... Yes. This question was, in his particular case, thank you for sharing it with us, he has wet macular degeneration, and he's been receiving those intravitreal injections to his eye. When he receives these medications, he feels an elevated pressure sensation in the eye that's very uncomfortable, and he's wondering if there's any way to avoid that. There are multiple techniques to administering the eye injections, and sometimes, depending on which technique is used, one might feel more pressure or a little bit more uncomfortable sensation. I try my best in my patients to be very gentle, very attentive, to provide very sufficient amounts of topical anesthetic so that they're very comfortable, as comfortable as they can be. So I would just recommend that you speak to your retina specialist and convey those symptoms you're having um, and be honest with them so they could try to work with you to try to make it a more comfortable experience. But right now, there's no other way of administering those medications other than that in-office injection. A question in the back, the back row. Yes. This gentleman uh, told us that he has macular degeneration, but he's also taking three different types of eye drops. And 
he's wondering what's the best way to administer these eye drops. Uh, first of all, the eye drops you're taking probably are not a treatment for the macular degeneration. It might be for another condition you have, sir. Is that correct? No, it's macular degeneration. It's bromonidine and um, the other Yeah. The drops that you mentioned, um, and I'll repeat the name, bromonidine, that's a treatment for elevated eye pressure or a condition called glaucoma, which is a distinct entity from age-related macular degeneration. Because right now, there's no effective eye drop that treats macular degeneration. The eye drops in your case are to treat high eye pressure, which is a different condition. The treatment um, that you're undergoing for your high eye pressure, the best way to administer the drops is to you know, tilt your head up, use one hand, to pull down the lower lid, the lower lid acts like an envelope, and you can drop the eye medication into the little lower lid envelope, rather than needing to drop it right in the center surface of the eye. That's the best way of preventing that eye drop from rolling down your cheek and then not really going to the area. But the eye drops you're on is for probably a condition called glaucoma and not age-related macular degeneration. Yes, there's a question in the back. Yes, I don't have MA, but how often should I have it on exam? The question is, how often should she have an eye exam if she does not have age-related macular degeneration? The American Academy of Ophthalmology recommends that everyone who is older, usually 48 years of age or older, have an eye exam at least once a year. And depending on what your ophthalmologist finds, you might need to be seen more frequently. But that's important because besides looking for age-related macular degeneration, you could have other eye conditions. If you had diabetes, you could have diabetic eye disease. You could have cataracts. You could have glaucoma. There are many different conditions that can arise in the eyes, and early detection is very important. Uh, yes, maybe the gentleman in the middle aisle there. Uh, yes. When treating uh, wet macular degeneration with injections, uh, there was an indication that with time, the number of injections per year goes down. Do you ever get to zero? The question is, in the studies, it seemed to indicate that if you're receiving those injections for wet macular degeneration, the number of treatments decrease over time. And will there ever be a need for no injections? We followed patients for over a decade now. And there are some patients who, after several years of treatment, their wet macular degeneration becomes inactive. But there are also many patients where they have kind of a waxing waning course, where it becomes a little inactive for a few months, but then it might become active again. So there are many patients who need chronic evaluation and chronic treatment. Maybe not every month, but maybe every three to four months they come in because their duration of disease is inactive for longer periods of time, but they do have these little recurrences. A question in the far back there? Yes. The question is, is there a difference between these anti-VEGF agents because there are some that are on-label or FDA approved and there's one that's off-label or that's in use but not FDA approved? Currently, there are three different anti-VEGF agents that can be injected to the eye. Fortunately, the bottom line is all of them are very effective. So you can't go wrong with either of those three choices. Two of them are FDA approved, and one of them is not. Now in medicine, there are a lot of treatments and medicines that are available that are off-label. That is, they were developed for one indication, but physicians found out that they work for another 
disease and they're effective. So there are many medications that you might be on right now that are off label. So for most of my patients, I'll say that any of those three medications are very effective. And there has only been no real definitive data to suggest that in age-related macular degeneration, one is clearly superior than the other. In some individual cases, patients respond better to one medicine than the other. So it's an individualized approach that we have to take. Uh, yes, the gentleman uh, in the back. So my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, is that you can only differentiate between the wet and the dry uh, types of macular degeneration when you get to the advanced stage. So the, the early and the intermediate, you can't tell the difference. Is that correct? The question is, can we distinguish between the early, intermediate, and advanced forms of macular degeneration? Fortunately, we can. And only a trained ophthalmologist or retina specialist can do that because a lot of that is based on clinical examination skills with ancillary imaging tests to confirm it. So yes, when I see patients, I can diagnose them with early macular degeneration or intermediate or advanced, depending on what I see on clinical examination. And depending on that diagnosis, it'll affect my recommendation on when they should return to see me. If they have early macular degeneration, I'll say, you could come back in a year. If they have intermediate, I'll recommend six months. If they have wet, then I'm treating them that day and then having them come back in a month. Uh, questions, sir? Yes. The question is, is there anything on the internet that would be helpful in advancing research knowledge of macular degeneration? Many of you are internet savvy, of course, we're living in Silicon Valley, and there's so much when we use a search engine like Google and we look up age-related macular degeneration, there are going to be thousands, thousands of references you could look at, but be careful what you read because not everything that's on the internet has been approved or reviewed by the American Academy of Ophthalmology or the American Society of Retina Specialists. So you have to be careful of what you read. As you said, there's a lot of fake news out there and there's a lot, of, it's so apt in this time, day and age, and there are a lot of people who are taking advantage of patients who are desperate for medical cures. If you see an ad on the internet that says, stem cell therapy effective for macular degeneration, fly here and pay you know, X amount of money, I would tell you, please do not do that for your safety. Because if it's an FDA approved treatment, your insurance will pay for it. You shouldn't have to pay out of pocket. And there currently is no effective stem cell therapy. So I think you have to discuss with your ophthalmologist or retina specialist um, in reliable reading aids. Many of them are on the American Academy of Ophthalmology website. I would recommend that. Great. Thank you very much. I thank you all for coming tonight. I really enjoyed discussing this important topic with all of you. I hope you learned something tonight and be happy to uh, talk with you at a future date. Enjoy your evening. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you.